we're rolling. Okay, let me quick press record on this. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the aftermath for Korean Zombie against Brian Ortega. Um, we've got one fight left on Fight Island. We have rattled out four amazing events, and uh, this one delivered as well. Uh, we've got some interesting talking points on this one. Um, not quite the finishes that we had on the last one. Um, I think Buckley's still winning for knockout of Fight Island so far. Um, but there were some good fights. And obviously, we started off with Saeed Namagomedov um, against Mark Striegel. And I expected this to be a really good fight. I, I think, obviously, Saeed Namagomedov is a talented individual. Just kind of has coasted at points in his previous UFC fights. And I've always wanted to see more from him. He's, he's got great t- uh, spinning back kicks, turning side kicks. He's very mobile on his feet, good in scrambles. And Mark Striegel's a good wrestler. And I was expecting him to be able to put Saeed under pressure. But he got caught with this shot really early. I mean, we, we, we started at the start of the round here. And and what I love about this is it's a very traditional uh, uh, technique. Just have a look at that. Watch that kick on the inside of his leg and how Saeed counters it. Kick, snap off the lead leg. You can tell he trains with a beat. That was lovely. Um, so this shot that that, uh, that starts the end of the fight is actually a is actually like a ridge hand. He actually lands with the inside of his uh, inside of his wrist here. Well, inside of his glove. Um, and I talk sometimes about JDS's kit, uh, hits at uh, punches, and it, he hits with the inside of the of the palm with his fist closed, which is, I always think is a strange one. So there's the shot. You'll see it better on the replay. But as Striegel gets hit, he immediately clamps onto a leg to try and get to safety, to try and control it. And unfortunately for him, Saeed Magomedov's wrestling takedown offense is, is almost as good as his striking. Um, so clamping onto a leg was probably not the right thing to do. But, I mean, what other options did he have? Um, so the shot that landed, that rocked him, was... Here we go. So watch as he closes distance. He comes in... So we've got Southpaw against Orthodox. We've got Striegel stepping in with this long punch here. And you see Saeed drop back and watch his lead arm extend out. And as he extends it out, he turns his palm down. So he's hitting him with the side of the wrist. I mean, in traditional martial arts, we call this a ridge hand. You're striking with this part here of the hand. And uh, I mean, it, when you go back to traditional martial arts, there's a lot of different striking points on the hand that they're a little bit restricted by gloves. Like if you put a pair of boxing gloves on, the boxing gloves kind of decide for your whereabouts with the hand you're going to strike. With with MMA gloves, it's the same because the padding comes around and covers the knuckles. There's, there's no no padding here. There's nothing on the thumb. The thumb's open. It, it, the, the glove comes around and leaves the thumb exposed. If you look at the old, uh, the Bong Sao gloves that uh, Bruce Lee used at the start of Enter the Dragon, when you close a fist, it, it kind of balls your hand. It, it turns your hand into a ball. So there are other positions you can strike in. Now, with an open palm, we, we, you know, you've got uh, palm heels, you've got, I mean, the, 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 the monkey paw, there's, there's different kinds of kung fu strikes that you can use that do very various different things. Bill G is a popular one, which is a finger strike. Um, and, and I think we're going to start seeing some, some of these start to creep their way into, into MMA a bit more. But this, this is nice. And, and, and what, what the ridge hand allows you to do is as it's coming in, look at the full extent of the arm. The power in it actually comes from the twisting of the body of Saeed as he's moving. You see, you'll, watch, you'll see the shoulder kind of pivot around a little bit as his body turns, and he, and he uses the full length of his arm. Bang, cracks him with right in the side of the hand, right in the side of the, the, uh, um, the fist. And it hits him, as you'll notice, right in the ear as well, which is perfect for knocking someone's equilibrium out. So as you'll see, Striegel kind of kind of loses balance here. His legs go. And as he goes down, and this is a great recovery because at this point, it looks like he's fallen. He's able to recover and go straight for a leg. I mean, you can see he's, he literally is scrambling here. Grabs a leg. Immediately, Saeed Namagomedov's in on takedown defense. But given the fact that Striegel's already kind of, kind of rocked and that Saeed has not only got good balance on that one leg but also continually strikes over and over again. And now he's coming up underneath. Here we go, there's a better angle. So, steps in. He was looking for that straight left look. That was coming over the top. And Saeed's out of the way of that. Just goes over his shoulder as he lands the ridge hand around the side. You see Striegel drop. He grabs onto a leg. 50% consciousness at this point. 
he's working partly on autopilot probably knows he's hurt knows he's in the fight but at the same time he's, he you know probably feels like he's underwater and then you've got Saeed on one leg posted on the shoulder with this hand keep him at a distance make sure he doesn't run up that leg and, and work to a body lock or run him into the fence and then he starts coming under the side and he's doing the same thing with the other hand look ridge hands bang same thing side of the hand across the side of the head that's the point where he drops and then as he lands here Saeed's just able to bully himself over to the top given the fact that Striegel's scrambling he's turned his head away here and then we get a couple of shots and, and Striegel hit at this point he's still in uh, at this point he's still in the fight it's this shot that lands that kind of that's the one that really does it and he takes a couple more and the referee jumps in Bang, bang, bang. Lovely work by Saeed Namagomedov. He's an exciting fighter in this division. You know, he picked up his loss in the UFC. And obviously it was a frustrating one for him. And he just didn't seem to get started in that fight. How many bars sell us? I think it was. Um, but it, we've got to keep an eye on him. I mean, we've seen what Zabit's able to do. If we put a bit, a bit more confidence in this guy, and that's the kind of fight that's going to give him confidence... A bit more confidence for him, and he's he's going to start flying. He really is real talent. Okay, moving on to the uh, the light heavyweights. So Antigolov fights, as I said on the broadcast, like he's left the cooker on. He doesn't like to wait around. Mo Twenty wins on his record, seventeen first round finishes, fifteen submissions as well. So it's not like he's just running in there and knocking people out. Like he closes distance aggressively, but then he's looking to get the fight to the floor. The times, sometimes his, his overzealousness, you know, it leaves him vulnerable. And you think back to the Paul Craig fight, he ran into ran into Paul Craig's guard. He got caught in a triangle, but wasn't thinking about triangle defense. He was thinking about hammer fists. And as we know, Paul Craig's got a wicked triangle. And Sigalov had also trained with Max Grishin. So they're aware of each other, that worked with each other on the mat. They weren't too keen about fighting each other from what I could tell. But, you know, this, this is what it is. We're not, we're not in a team sport here. So the first round was quite, as you see we're here, we're in the second round. The first round was quite cautious from um, Antigolov. And, and what Grishin said in the post-fight interview is it's because it's he knows I'm better than him. You know, we've trained together, he knows I'm better than him. So Antigolov being cautious in the first round, it gave a bit more confidence to Grishin, who started to take control in the second round. He'd had some top control, etc., etc. But this is the end of the fight. And... One thing that, that fighters need to realize is intelligently def intelligent defense doesn't mean putting your hands up and staying on your feet because Antigolov is, is leaning up against the fence here and you could quite easily make an argument for the fact that he's not intelligently defending himself because he's not facing his opponent. The, the frustrating thing for him, as you can see, we're ticking down. It was two seconds before the end of the round that the fight was stopped. The referees, you know, that's not his concern. If you're not intelligently defending yourself at whatever point in the fight, the, the referee will jump in and, and save you. Um, wait, wait, let me get, get back to that one. I just There's just a point I want to show you in the, in the finish of that fight, which is where the, the quality shots were landed. And Max Christian, it's worth noting, made his debut at heavyweight against Marcin Tabora. He's not a heavyweight. He's a light heavyweight. This is a much better weight class for him. Um... And I think, you know, I think we, we might have another very interesting fighter in this division. He's got loads of fights on his record. He's 40 fights in his pro career. He was fighting UFC veterans 10 fights into his career. He's, he's, a, he's a good fighter. He's patient. And that was, that's one criticism that you could have. Sometimes he allows the fight to kind of drift away from him a little bit before he drags it back into, you know, into his control. Um, and, and Sigalov, had he started fast, he might, might have been able to catch him cold, but he, but he didn't. And I think that's partly because they trained together. Okay, let's have a quick look at this. So you, as you can see, Antigolov's closed him down. He wanted this fight at close range because Grishin's a good distance striker. He controls the octagon very well, but he's already up on total strikes, as you can see. He's already kind of running this show. So he's look at that little jog out there. So he's in a bit of a bad position here up against the fence. Um, Antigolov's got head position, and he's going to jog himself out and catch the right hand on the back of the head and start to pull his head down. That allows him to turn. Then he lands an elbow on the inside as he turns. Big elbow. Steps across him with the right hook. And then he's right in front of him. And, he, and a, the variety of shots is nice. He's going right hook to the body. 
left hook to the body, right hook to the body. And then he's going to pull his... See, see, then this is the point where Antigolov decides he needs to fire back because he knows he's under pressure. And this is where you see an experienced fighter that's not too focused on his own attack because Antigolov's going to dip and he's going to throw this wild right overhand and you see Grissom just dip out the way of it, right out the way. And Antigolov now is backed up against the fence and he just he always looks like he's tired to me. <laughs> Even at the start of the fight, he looks like he's tired. But there's a lovely move here. He just pries, it, pries his guard open with the jab, fires the right hand through but misses. And as you can see, Antigolov's now starting to scoot along the fence so he starts to pursue him. And there's a lovely wrist control where he drags his arm out of the way to hit him. Where are we? Firing that jab out with no intention of landing it, trying to find his way through the guard. And Tigalov covers that one. Okay, here we go. So, th so the left hand grabs the wrist and the glove of Antigolov, or the hand rather, and drags it out of the way. Look how he fires it across his body to expose a target there. Slides it across, opens up his opportunity because he tried a couple of times. He threw the jab, which sometimes had crept through the guard, but because that wasn't meant to land, he was firing the right hand after it. So he would go a lazy jab to range find, then he'd fire the right hand and it had hit his guard twice. So he tries a different tactic. Pause it with his left hand, drives it across, and then that punch right across the chin. As you see, it turns Antigolov's head and then he lands another left hook on the end of it. And this is where you start to think, if you're the referee, you see, that's, the, that's a big right hook. Bang. And that point, you can kind of see Antigolov's body kind of, it loses some of its strength, some of its stability. And at this point, and this doesn't look too bad. I mean, he's having a flurry here. These, you know, I mean, these are powerful shots because of the size of the guy. Gets himself out of the way again of another shot. But th at this point, this is where he starts to look really vulnerable. And when we look from camera seven, I'll play it through. When we look from camera seven, what you'll see is that the position of Antigolov's body, he's leaning into the fence. And that's a telltale sign that someone's not in this fight. If you think back to the uh, the Gillian Robertson Macy Barber fight, like she, that fight was stopped right as Gillian Robertson was throwing a punch back, but she was backed up against the fence. She was covering. Oh, there's the there's the the grip the the guard strip again. I love that. Bang. I always I always enjoy watching uh, Gennady Golovkin fights in slow motion because he uses these kind of tricks. One of my favorite things that Golovkin does is he fires his jab past the head of his opponent. And then he uses his elbow to pull the guard out of the way for his right hand. It's very, very slick movements. Um, that was really nice. And then a few extra shots to follow up. It, the right hook was a big one. It lands right on the side of his chin. You can even see the, flex, the flexation through his neck. Let me just see if I can play that through and zoomed in. Watch this trapezius here. Oh, I can't. Watch the trapezius here. I mean, you can see that muscle contracting to try and pull his head back in under control. That was a powerful shot. As I said, we're going to switch to camera seven in a minute, which is from the top position. And that's when you can see the posture of Antigolov looks far more vulnerable. And the referee's there. He's at the right side to be able to see him leaning into the fence and, and the fence bowing up against his weight. Look, look at the, the lack of stability here. He's leaning into the fence and he's just taking a, a, a barrage of punches. You can't stay there. It doesn't matter whether the round's ticking down or not. You just can't stay in those positions. Intelligently defending is not closing your eyes, putting your hands up and turning away from your opponent, even if you're on your feet. Okay. Right. We're going to get into this fight a little bit. I, I, I just want to go through the first round. So this is the uh, what, what I picked to be fight of the night, what I expected to be a, a really competitive one. Obviously, Mateus Gamrot coming in 17-0-1 was his record. He'd never fought anybody with a losing record. He was a decorated champion coming out of Poland. A lot of hype around him, and rightly so. He's an excellent fighter. He's got good boxing, likes to work his way into range and start lighting people up. He's predominantly a southpaw, but he will switch to orthodox if he needs to. And he's got great wrestling scrambles, which we saw in this fight. His opponent, uh, Goram Kutateladze, which is not the easiest uh, name to say on the broadcast over and over again. But DC nailed it. I was proud of him, and I did tell him that. Um... Kutateladze is coming in. He was 11 and 2 coming into this. He had, um, he's Georgian. He's got a wrestling background as well, but he's predominantly a Muay Thai fighter. Um, 
he wanted this fight at kicking range because that's his strength. He's got ridiculously powerful kicks. And fortunately, given the fact that there was nobody in the arena, there was no noise, we could hear those kicks ringing around the, the arena. And I think maybe that was part of the reason why some of these some of these shots were scored quite highly for him because Gamrot was blocking a lot of these shots on his arms. But there comes a point where blocking a kick of that kind of power you're choosing whether you want to take it on the body or take it on the arm. The option is always to take it on the arm, but it doesn't mean it's not damaging or affecting that limb. Um, there was actually a point at the end of the first round, which you don't quite catch it on the on the TV feed, but I was watching Gamrot right at the end of the second round, and uh, right at the end of the first round, and as soon as the first round had finished, he started to kind of shake his, left, his right hand out a bit, almost like he damaged it, blocking or catching one of those kicks. Okay. I'm not going to get into the whole fight because it's a 15-minute split decision and go back and watch it. This is a great talking point, which I do want to continue on to this week because I'm, I'm going to try and get one of the judges. We've got a judge here who's always a, a fascinating person for me to talk to. This fight under the old scoring criteria could have, could have quite easily been scored for Gamera. I think the reason it went to Kutateladze is because of the new scoring criteria and the differences between the two. And the, unfortunately, this wasn't made very public. So even even Goram himself at the end of the fight in his post-fight interview, he said, he, I didn't win this fight. This wasn't my fight. Had he understood the new scoring criteria better, he may have understood where he won the fight and how. Now, again, I'm not saying this was the right decision or the wrong decision. It was a razor-thin decision. And this is one of the reasons why a judge has to be specifically a judge. You have to focus entirely on that, on the scoring criteria. You have to know that scoring criteria inside out. I'm going to focus on the first round because if you notice, all of the judges had the second and third rounds the same. Every judge had Guram Kutataladze win in the second round. Every judge had Gamrot for the third. The reason for that most likely is because Guram was very active in the second round. He landed a knockdown very early. All of the scrambles that were coming from, that were initiated by Gamrot were either being denied by Kutataladze or as soon as they landed, uh, Goran was attacking, um, which even if you're in the top position, if you're defending submissions, you're not, you're not the aggressor in the fight. It, it's kind of, it, it's difficult to, to kind of explain how the, how the judging criteria works for this. And, and the difference is in the old criteria, it was much more about control time. It was much more about, like if you had one guy on the feet that was winning kickboxing for two minutes, the other guy took him down and controlled for three minutes in the top position, they would score the three minutes control top position higher because of the control. Whether that's right or wrong, I, I'm, I, I'm not one to comment. I prefer, to, I prefer the scoring as it is now because I think it forces the fighters to look for look for a finish. It, it forces them to try and engineer the end of a fight, which is really what this is all about. Controlling people is not fighting, it's controlling people. And and for me, I always go back to the original, the, the foundation of what martial arts is about. It's a martial art, it's about warfare. It's about keeping yourself alive as efficiently as possible. And I didn't grow up in a time where we had sport MMA, like, my martial arts training was, okay, I need to be able to defend myself against one, two, three guys. Taking someone down and holding them down is not intelligently defending yourself on the street. You need to deal with that person because his friend's going to come and kick you in the side of the head when you've got him in, in side control. It's a different mentality. You can play towards the sport and a lot of people when they come from a wrestling background or, or you know, some, some points scoring, like point karate backgrounds, a lot of fighters, they use the time and they use the, the the rounds and they work to the rounds. They work, right, I win the first five minutes, I win the next five minutes. I always watch a fight based on who's trying to find the finish because the finish is what it's all about. And, and, and both fighters in there should be working to get the fight ended as, as quickly and as efficiently as possible. And that's what shows the greatest skill level in, in mixed martial arts to me. It's not being able to dominate somebody for 15 or 25 minutes. As impressive as that is, the domination needs to lead to, or at least have an effort to lead towards finish. Okay, with that being said, we've got one judge scoring the first round for Gamrot. 
and we've got two judges scoring the first round for Goran Kutateladze. This first round was razor thin. I've watched it two or three times today. <laughs> I could still score it either way. I could still find reasons and ways to score it. And this is this is the challenge that the judges have. And this is something that they have to be focused on in the moment. They have to make those decisions at the end of that five minute round before the next round starts. Okay, so the first round starts. I'm just gonna let this play through. There might be a couple of things I'm gonna pick out for you, but I'm just gonna talk you through this as it's happening. So Goram starts out. And he's trying to create space. He's trying to keep distance from Gamrot because he's trying to land these kicks. That's the, the, the main focus of his weapons. He's got good hand strikes as well, but predominantly if he's going to break somebody down, it's going to be his kicks. And what you'll notice here is that Gamrot's in a southpaw stance, which opens up the body kick for Kutataladze, which was blocked there by Gamrot. And this just shows the striking level of Gamrot as well. Catches that right on the shin. Lovely. That saves you uh, blocking things on the forearm. It's not a great deal better, but it's a little bit. The thing is, if you're blocking things on the arm, it's going to slow down your punches. It's going to bruise up the arm. If you think back to the fight with uh, Casey Kenny against Alateng Haley, he battered the ribs and the arm. And that elbow at the end of that fight was almost like he'd had it tattooed. Anybody that's had their elbow tattooed knows how much it swells up. You get a lot of fluid around that joint, which slows the movement down, slows the, the strikes down. Okay, first first takedown. We're we're just inside a minute into the right into the round. It's a really nice takedown from Gamrot. He shoots a really low single. Look how low he gets. He's right on the calf there. And the reason he finishes this is because he pulls it close to him. And as Kutataladze tries to bail out, gets his knee to the floor, Gamrot continually moves forward, but then elevates his leg. You can just about see the toes here of Gamrot. So that's what we're looking at. Oh, I didn't know I could do that. Here we go. You, so you can see Gamrot's now elevated that. So Goram did a great job of, of defending initially, but then as the scramble goes on, he gets bullied over and that catch on the back of the hip as well. So he's got control of the back, the back, of, the back of the hip here and he's still elevating this ankle. So he's kind of tipping him up. Like think, think like you're emptying a bucket. You know, you're holding the bucket at the front and you're pouring the water out by lifting the back of the bucket up. That's what he's doing here. So he drives him over and lands in a good position. And this, this is, is good control by, by Gamera. Immediately, Kutataladze ties him up. So a lot of these strikes are stifled. But this is top control. This is ground and pound. He goes to mission control, which is, which is a good control position, but he's not attacking with it right now. And Gamera's able to bail out. A little bit of space is created for Goran, but still the forward pressure is coming from Gamera, who now is working to pass, progress his position, and he's still landing shots. So this now, we've got a good takedown, which is effective, he's established control, he's, he's progressing his position, and he's trying to land some shots. But at this point, we start to see it shift a little bit, and we start to see Kutataladze control. And although he's taking shots here, you can see he's got the overhook on this arm. And this is a weird one. This is kind of, there's a, is it Pete Williams? He catches this really awkward position. I know Frank, I know Frank Mir's got one as well. So it's not an arm bar because obviously the arm bar is straight and the emphasis is on extending, hyper-extending the elbow. In this position, the elbow twists on the inside. Going this way, there's nothing. Going this way, you're putting yourself in, a, in an Americana position, like a key lock position. So it's putting the pressure, it's putting the pressure on, on Gamrot's shoulder here because there's a twist happening. And you'll also notice that Kutataladze has got his foot on the inside, which is going to change position in a moment. Still taking shots, but you see how the leg comes around from inside the hip. It comes around and over the head. This is the point now where Gamera has to start thinking defensively. This is the point where top control switches to defense and where judges will sometimes go, ah, oh, well, okay, top control's good. Your landing strike's excellent, but now the, the onus has shifted over to defense because this arm is isolated and it's and it's vulnerable. He doesn't stay here for long, but there is certainly a control. You can see that this is the elbow point of, uh, of, of Gamrot there, which is definitely not pointing in the right direction if you're wanting to uh, pass and continue working. He's landing elbows, absolutely, but at the same time, Goram knows that this is a decent position to be in, which is why he's keeping a hold of it. It forces Gamrot to bail out, which then allows... Um, Kutataladze to switch to an ankle lock. And this this is a fairly decent attack. 
Like this would count as a submission attack. It does count as a submission attack. I had the stats in front of me. So now Garam's defending. Sorry, Gamrot's defending. Garam is attacking. So we've had, what, a minute or so of control for, uh, for, uh, for Gamrot, and now he's defending. He goes to attack an ankle, but he has no control over it. So now they're back to the feet. <laughs> we've got, and that's the first half of the first round. Like, I mean, you can just imagine how difficult these, these rounds are to score for some of these judges because they're just so back and forth. This was a fight of the night. Uh, I would have been happy with this being a draw, to be honest. Because um, the thing is, I could even have seen the second round being a 10-8 for Kutataladze, given the fact that he knocked Gamrot down. Again, it's all subjective. Gamrot was on one leg when he took the overhand. So you could say, ah, oh, maybe he was knocked off balance partially, et cetera, et cetera. It, it's, it's so difficult sometimes to separate these fighters. But see, now there's, there's, a, there's a difference in pace. And as this round starts to progress, I feel like Kutataladze starts to, starts to fire in some decent shots. Gamrot's still working well. He's still landing his own shots. And, and this, like I said, this is a razor thin round. Like you could show me this on a Monday and I'll score it one way. Show it me on a, on a Tuesday with no prior memory and I'll score it the opposite way. It, usually I can pick a round clean, in my opinion, based on who won. But this is one of those rounds that is just, it's just so difficult to score. So, you know, do, do you score the takedown? See, now we've got a takedown defended here. And... Something that's that, a phrase that's always worth remembering. Defense is its own reward, right? You, you don't you don't score somebody for head movement. You don't score somebody for takedown defense. They're worth noting, but that for me that that falls into the into the scoring criteria of octagon control because. So think about this. If I'm a counter striker, I'm moving back and I'm allowing my opponent to walk towards me. That doesn't mean that they're controlling the octagon because I'm the one that's choosing to move back. I'm the one that's choosing which angle I'm moving off at to force them to walk onto my shots. And this is where you need really educated judges to be able to tell the difference between octagon control and following someone around. It goes the same when, you, when you're playing guard, right? If you're a guard player, and this is why it's risky in MMA, and I, I always say this to, to, to the fighters that I'm working with, if, you, if you're fighting from guard, you're losing until you win. Because if somebody else is on top, generally, most people will score them as being the winner of that round, the, the winner of those moments. If you're a guard player and you know you've got a good guard, you're taking a risk by going to your back and trying to fight off your back because you're effectively allowing them to, to take control of the judges' scorecards while you're trying to instigate the finish. The, the, dif the difference in the new scoring criteria for me seems much more like takedowns and wrestling is much more viewed like octagon control and not like progression to win the fight. You, you have, if you're a grappler, you have to take the fight down to win the fight. That's your option. If you're a striker, you have to keep the fight standing in order to keep it in your wheelhouse. So although this is a takedown defended, we don't we don't score um, we don't score the defense, but we also don't score that takedown attempt unless there's hardly anything else going on in the round. So I would then lead that towards mm, Kutataladze is deciding now where this fight's taking place because he's the one that's defending the takedowns. Again, it's all subjective. We could debate this all day, every day. And, you know, very experienced judges will see things slightly differently. And that's why the scoring criteria gets quite confusing because it is rather subjective. And it is also influenced by the background of the judges. You know, if you've got a Brazilian jiu-jitsu uh, um, athlete as one of the judges they're going to see the fight very differently to a k1 fighter it's just the reality of it and as we progress we're going to get more mma fighters crossing over to judging they'll understand the judging more and i think we'll get it will get a clearer understanding there's a second there we go a second takedown attempt there and a very borderline knee which i mean if we'd have got a point deducted there it might have made the whole thing a lot easier for the judges so again, we've got Gamrot, he throws a jab and then he level changes. But look at that switch from Kutataladze. Because he knows as this punch comes out, Gamrot's level changing and he's attacking this leg. That's what he's going for. So as that happens, watch him switch his stance to remove that leg. He goes down and he reaches for a leg that's just not there. That is a lovely takedown offense. And then he bullies him over to the side. And he does, he does throw a very kind of borderline knee here. But unfortunately for Gamrot, 
as it lands, he is not on the floor. He's on both his feet. It was a knee to the shoulder, and it was it, it was legal anyway, but it would have been very borderline. Like you can see, he's on his feet there. It would have been very borderline in the moment for the referee to make that call. It would have been very difficult. For me, just bring knees back to the head. I've got no issue with them. If you get a knee in the head on the floor, don't be in that position. It's it's common sense. I have no problem with this, and I think it would change the sport significantly. It certainly forced people to set up their shots a bit better. Because, um, you know, as, as we had the, the, the conversation about the, uh, the Khabib um, uh, McGregor knee, the one that he kind of slid across the side, the side of his chin as he was trying to hit him on the takedown. There's been a lot of a lot of instances where a knee's been borderline. The other one I can think of is uh, Jose Aldo against Cub Swanson. Beautiful timing on that. Way back in the WEC days. Um, anyway, the point is that that knee was fine. And we have another takedown defended here. So that's one of three takedowns in the first round uh, that have been landed by Gamrat. Two of the three have been defended by uh, Kutataladze. So for me, he's dictating where this fight happens. The, the time on the floor is where it gets quite subjective. You know, do you score the takedown and the ground and pound? How significant was that ground and pound compared to the arm attack and the, 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 the heel hook attack? Like we're into the last 10 seconds of this round. A lot of these shots, they're glancing shots, they're landing on guard. It's, it's so difficult in the moment to judge. And that's the point I'm going to make here. And I'm not going to continue on with this fight because they just, just see there, look. Watch Gamrock go straight for his left, to for his right hand. And unfortunately, the camera follows Kutataladze back to his corner. You will see Gamrock in the background, but he, like, trust me, he was shaking out his hand. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a fracture in that. Yeah, you can't quite see him in the background. He was, he was kind of, he was just doing this and he was like shaking his hand out. And I don't know whether he'd kind of blocked a cross and caught his hand on one of those kicks. Let's have a conversation in the comment section below because this, this is one of those things that this is where MMA is still growing, still developing. We've not got it all figured out and nailed down. This, this is a very, very subjective first round. The second and third round, as I said, the judges went you know, either way. Uh, they went the same way. There was no disagreement on the second and third round. Second for Kutataladze, third round for Gamrot. The lasting impression in Kutataladze's mind is that it was a very even first round. He probably won the second round, but then Gamrot, you know, really came on strong in the third round, as you would expect. Unbeaten fighter in a very close fight, trying to protect that O. I wouldn't mind seeing these guys rematch. I wouldn't have minded seeing them fight over over five rounds, to be honest. Um, they, they're both they're both veteran fighters, even though uh, Garam's only got thirteen fights on his record, and, uh, and Gamrot's got what eighteen. Um, we st we're still good, so, yeah. Um, I grabbed the stats. This is on UFC stats. Um, and again, it doesn't paint the full picture. There's, there's certain things that you can focus on here. So um, th this is this this above this line is total. This is everything that happened in the fight over the three rounds, which again, doesn't tell you the full picture because you need it dividing up. I'll, I'll, be, I'll tell you the truth. At the end of the fight, as DC was getting up to go into the octagon, he said to me, well, what do you think? And I'm like, I don't really know. I kind of feel like Goram took it. But that's because in my head, I remembered the knockdown. I remembered his takedown defense. I remembered the pressure he was putting on Gamrot in the, uh, um, with his kicks. The stats screen in front of me, as far as total strikes landed, it had Gamrot winning. And that's what we see here. You know, he's, he's a decent amount of strikes ahead. Um, but again, you know, are we, are we counting the, the, the hammer fists on the floor? Are we counting the body kicks? It's, you know, you weigh it up in your own head and you make your decisions. And this is, you know, you, you take whatever knowledge you've got, prior experience of martial arts, mixed martial arts, you apply them to the judging criteria, and then you kind of weigh up and you make that judgment call yourself. These are the kind of fights where I wouldn't mind seeing a couple of extra judges. Because, you know, you've got one judge going one way and two going the other way. If we've got five judges, you might have two to three, you might have one to four, and then we've got a clearer decision going. And and I think that that, that may be the progression that we'll have, as well as, more, you know, fighters moving into judging after the room, after their careers. Okay, what I'm looking at here is there's a few things I'm looking at. I'll focus on the total strikes first uh, over the over the round, and then I'll have a quick look at the, uh, the the other strikes as we break them down. So, one knockdown for Gurum. That was the second round, as we know. 
five takedowns landed of 16. That's a 31% success rate. But as I was saying, we're not scoring the defense, but it does lean towards octagon control. Control time for uh, Gamrot was three and a half minutes. Control time is, again, subjective based on whether you feel like the strikes that he was landing when he was caught up in the arm are more valuable than the arm attack itself. So top control doesn't necessarily mean that you're you're in control, um, especially if your arm is being locked onto by, by somebody. So Gamrot was winning on total strikes uh, as well as significant strikes. Total strikes, 69. Significant strikes, 52. If you look at the success rate of them, though, this is what this is what's interesting. The success rate was quite close, but the success rate of Guram was higher, which again could be down to his octagon control, forcing uh, Gamrot to miss, forcing him to, to move on to shots that are more powerful and more significant. Because again, a lot of these shots were racked up on the floor. Okay. If we go down to this to the individual rounds, and again, you can see how razor thin it was. Like this, this round, this is the second round where the knockdown happened. And... Kutataladze is one strike behind, but had a 40% success rate instead of 35. He also got a knockdown. So for me, that's a more successful round for him quite comfortably. He also defended four or five takedowns, which again, you know, shows good octagon control, good awareness. But you can see how close these stats are. Close round could have gone either way. How do you score the submissions? Close round, but still the knockdown scored it for me. The defense of the takedowns forced... Uh, Gamrot to fight in a stand-up position when probably he would have preferred it on the floor. But then you look at the third round and this is where Gamrot starts to run away with it. He lands a lot of shots. He scores three takedowns in this third round. 42% success rate on that. And he's also leading on the success of the striking as well. So a clear third round for Gamrot. And if, and if you compile it all together, you could probably say, yeah, Gamrot won the fight. But if you divide it up into three sections, which is obviously what the judges are doing, because they don't wait until the end of the fight to, to give their scores. They watch the first round, they mark their card. They watch the second round, they mark their card. The, it's scored in segments. Sometimes we view it as, as a fight in, in itself, as a fight in, as a whole. And again, that is where that is why you and, uh, you and me, we're not judges. You may be a judge out there and you may disagree with me. And if you do, put comments in the section below. I'm interested to see what people think of this. I might even start a poll on my Twitter page because I would like to know how people scored this instinctively. A, a, a journalist asked me a, a few weeks ago, the question came to me, um, if, if, I'm a, if I'm a new viewer to mixed martial arts, what should I be watching out for? And if you're just getting into watching MMA, it's a very difficult thing to, to, to watch because you, there are so many facets to the game, so many things that are happening. So I tried to I tried to make it as simple as possible, and I said to him, if you, if if this is the first time ever you're watching an MMA fight, try and decide who would be your tribal leader. <laughs> and I know it's a weird thing to say, but that's what I'm. That's kind of that's if I boil it down, that's what my instinct is looking for. I'm looking for the alpha in that scenario. I'm looking for the one that I feel has got the confidence and the skills and the the, the decision making to lead me into a battle and keep us safe. And again, I know sport, et cetera, et cetera. This, it goes all different kinds of ways when we start debating this. But it, it's just an interesting way of watching fights because ultimately that's really what we're looking for. We're looking for the dominant fighter. We're looking for the winning fighter, the one that makes good decisions, that keeps themselves safe, that is effective with their skills and skilled. Um, so that's something to think about as you're watching fights. I also pulled up this page, which is where a lot of the significant strikes landed. And again, we've got Gamrot focusing primarily on the head, um, but we've also got 20% of those strikes being landed on the floor. So, you know, again, you know, effectiveness of those strikes compared. Whereas if we look at um, Kutataladze, he's got a nice division. I mean, he's literally dividing his game up into thirds and attacking every section of the body. But then we've got 94% strikes landed at distance, which allows kicks as opposed to punches, which allows more power, more wind up, more momentum into the shots. It also requires you to, to think a lot more about how you're applying the shots because the person's not being held down to, to take those shots. You'll, you'll all remember if you watched the fights uh, last night, the, uh, the Iron Turtle, um, uh, Jun Yong Park taking on John Phillips. Um, I'm not covering that fight because it was a, it was a weird one and a frustrating one to watch. I'm, I'm, 
I'm not exactly sure where John Phillips was, but he wasn't in the octagon. That's not the not the John Phillips I know. Um, Jun Yong Park broke the UFC record for total strikes landed in a fight. He landed over 300 strikes in that fight, but I think maybe three on the feet. Every single one of his strikes would land on the floor. But yeah, they're strikes, but they don't count the same as a power body kick, even a power body kick to the to the to the arm. For me, it's just they're not as significant. Um, so, so the strikes landed at distance is is key for me as well because um, it, it shows that there's, there's there's an option for a variety of shots, and we know he was landing some powerful body kicks that were ringing around the arena when they were landing. Um, but again, you know, stats don't paint the full picture, but I always think it's interesting just to kind of take a look back and see where they're at. Um, and I also look at stats across rounds consistently over a, a fighter's career to see where they apply their game the most, which I'll, I'll circle back to in the, uh, um, I'll circle back to when, when we're covering the main event. Okay. Jimmy Crew against Modestus Bukowskis. Two young prospects in the light heavyweight division. Uh, Modestus came through Cage Warriors. He was Cage Warriors champion. Um, he had a lot of fights where people wanted to ground him and, and control him on the floor and beat him up because he's a long range striker. He's got good boxing, good kicks, particularly the lead leg, particularly the lead leg. So, excuse me, Jimmy Crew has got the great Sam Greco in his corner and the formidable Dan Kelly, which we've got a, a Raptor interview coming out soon with those boys, both fascinating individuals, veterans of the game. And two guys that kind of, they complement each other's skill set. They're both learning from one another in, in a mixed martial arts context, but we've got Dan Kelly coming from judo, competed in mixed martial arts. We've got Sam Greco, who was an excellent K1 fighter. And what they've got in Jimmy Crute is a young man that's enthusiastic, that's got all the physical attributes that he would need. He's got the punching power, he's got the speed, he's got the strength. In the, in the last two fights that we've seen, he's also got the mindset. Going into the Serkinov fight, which is the fight he lost, which at points he was still winning that fight and he could have quite easily got the finish in that fight at, at points. Um... It was a confidence thing for him. We spoke to him during the fighter interviews, and and it was just he wasn't he wasn't sure enough of himself. He was doubting himself, and coming out of that fight, you know, he really had to had to you know switch on his his yeah, the psychological side of his game and start fine tuning a few things. And then he went went into the Michelle Oleg Shadrup fight, and he looked in, incredible. He, you know, he got the takedown. He finished with the Kimura, um, a dominant fight. Coming into this one against Jimmy against uh, Bukowskis. One thing that Crute would have been aware of is the way that Bukowskis won his UFC debut, which was defending takedowns up against the fence with those Travis Brown elbows to the side of the head. So there's a thought process for Jimmy Crute that maybe I don't want to get too close to him, work my takedowns up against the fence. Now, we did clinch him up against the fence, and it was before this, it was in the first minute, and there was a groin strike, which is why I've kind of skipped past it and where it was sort of 50 seconds in now. But this is what we're watching out for. Because Bukowskis has got a long range, long range style, and he looks to me like he's got a karate background. I'm pretty sure he has it. Where's my paperwork? Where are we? Here we go. Here we go. Paperwork for days. Um, I'm pretty sure he's got a karate background. I'm sure I read this. It's been a long night. Yeah, karate black belt, former Cage Warriors light heavyweight champ. Um, so six first round finishes, eight wins by knockout, 91% finishing rate for Modestus. Does his work on the feet. But you can see the karate style in him because the lead leg comes up to snap. Well, I mean, there's a hop sidekick there, which just misses the midsection. But it's important what we're, what we're watching Jimmy Crute do. Watch the right hand. He's looking to throw mortars over the top and land on, on Bukowskis while he's on one leg, which he tries a few times. This is the first attempt. Comes over the top, and Bukowskis just manages to shrink out of the way of it. But that should have been his first warning. As the fight progresses, again, just watch the right hand of Jimmy Crute because it's in main focus. It's almost like he decided what he was going to do. I'm going to chop into the lead leg, and every time you throw that lead leg, I'm going to try and hit you with my right hand. And, he, and the difference, again, with with a, a karate fighter and a Muay Thai fighter is go back to the knockout. Oh, look at, there he is. Go back to the knockout with um, Marlon Marais against Jimmy Rivera. 
and you'll see that he cracks him across the top of the head and knocks him out with the kick. And you'll remember in the breakdown, it's, it's in the war room, you can have a look at it yourself. Um, the Marais Sanhagen fight, I, I, I broke it down and, it, and you can see both of those kicks next to each other, the Aljamain Sterling knockout and the Jimmy Rivera knockout. The difference with the Muay Thai kick is that the knee comes across the midsection, which doesn't give your opponent the opportunity to quite close distance as, as quickly. Whereas the karate kicks, they come up around the side, which for someone aggressive leaves that center channel open. And that's just a difference in styles of kicks. Um, it's the same in Taekwondo as well. The turning side kick, the, sorry, the, the, the turning kick in Taekwondo, it does leave that center channel open. It was one of the first things I had to tweak when I started competing in Muay Thai. I had to bring my leg right around and across so the shin comes across almost at a 45 degree angle. So you've almost got a guard there if somebody starts closing distance. Watch the right hand again. Steps in with the jab, slips off to the side, parries it with the lead hand. I mean, <laughs> Modestus had the warnings. He had the warnings. It was clear what Jimmy Crute was trying to do. Hit the lead leg, crack you with the overhand right. And Jimmy Crute, I mean, it's, it's no coincidence that his last name rhymes with brute. It's the style of the way he fights. He's quite happy to walk you down. I mean, you remember his uh, was it, uh, contender series was just, it was just a wild fight. It, you know, he, he, it's a blood and guts kind of fight for Jimmy Crew. And with the two specialists that he's got in his corner, they've started to polish and refine his, his style. So he's still got the same mentality, but the mentality is applied in a much safer way. Watch this. Again, Bukowskis is having his leg chopped to bits. They were just cutting down his movement. He's standing heavier on that lead leg, but beautiful work. And my, my Twitter's blown up with the uh, the baby giraffe comment. I'm glad you liked it. I don't know where this nonsense comes from. When it's five o'clock in the morning and I've been talking for six hours already, uh, I don't know where my brain makes these connections. Okay, so what, watch the kick of Modestus. He steps in, tries to disguise it with the jab. Jimmy Crute slips and he's coming over the top. And the knee hits him, but as you can see, he's already too close to the leg. He's already too close to the body for it to make a difference. A Muay Thai kick, the shield would have been a cross, which would have maybe stopped some of that forward momentum. It's still not ideal because he's on one leg throwing a kick. And this is another reason why it looks so dramatic when you when you punch over kicks, is because you can knock somebody off balance. I go back to the Gamrot fight. When he got caught with that overhand, he was on one leg. Um, you can get called on a knockdown when really it's, it was probably a knocking off balance. I mean, this was definitely a knockdown. But Crute slips the right hand look and he's coming over the top. And this punch is already on its way. He's not even bothered about the kick. He knows he's close enough to not really have to worry too much about it. And because Modestus throws the kick as he does, like he was looking for that, that kick to snap out. Look, you can see how his foot extends there. He wasn't expecting that to meet Jimmy Crute there. And because it was coming, it was coming around the side like a traditional karate kick, it left that center channel open. Let's just watch it one more time. Bang. Lovely shot. And then the uppercut followed by the left hook. Same hand two times in a row and then comforts him, which was lovely. Until he realizes the door's there, cameraman needs to come in. And then he realizes that Dana's sitting Octagon side and he's gonna go have a quick word with, with Uncle Dana. And I love the security guard trying to, trying to chase him. These poor old security guards, they have, the, they have the most difficult job, trying to stop people celebrating when their fighters are won by knockout, trying to stop, like, um, Hamzat was smashing the Octagon during the, the Goran fight. and. Obviously, you know, you bang the octagon three times. That sounds like the 10 second uh, clapper. So that's one, that's the reason why they're trying to control that. But the, these security guards, you know, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Get off the fence. Don't climb over the fence and go and speak to Dana. It's, it's, it's one of the most difficult jobs in the world because you, you're basically telling people to do exactly what they're going to do every time the fight comes to an end. Here we go. Look at that. It's lovely. You, you can see the slip on this one as well. You can see how, how well Jimmy Crute gets his head out the center line. And the momentum that's coming from Bukowskis, it, it's clear that he's not just throwing the jab. You can also see this arm drop down to the side, which is a tell in someone loading a kick. They'll throw that arm down as a way of stepping through and counterbalancing themselves. So the jab comes out, it goes right over Jimmy Crute's shoulder. You can see the hand's not clenched though. I mean, it's, you can see that that's like that. There's no, there's no intention of landing that punch. It was literally to set, set the kick up. When we've seen people throw this in the past, think to, uh, I mean, we covered it recently, didn't we? Um, Cowboy against Matt Brown, um, Kevin Lee against uh, uh, Gregor Gillespie. Um, 
what was the more recent one? Randy Costa. Throw a punch to get them to move their head back and you throw the kick on the end as they're moving out of your punching range. It's Jimmy Crute though, he's a brute. <laughs> if you throw a punch at him, he's not going to move back, he's going to move forward. He's going to move past it, which is what he does here. And what Bukowskis wanted was for Jimmy Crute to jog back so he could snap him with this kick as this leg's coming up and he was hoping Jimmy Crute was going to be back here somewhere and catch that, that kick on the side of the head which obviously it didn't happen. And Jimmy Crute powers this over the top. Look how close he keeps that. Look how close he keeps that to his body. And I know that's an odd thing to notice, but a lot of people wing those punches out and it becomes much more of a momentum thing. He's holding that, ready to fire that over the top. And that tricep is now working like a piston because you get the extension from the, from the arm as well as the forward momentum of the body. Comes over and as the arm straightens, that's where, the, that's where you get the tricep flexing to straighten the arm and it is right on his chin and that is a good mouth guard because most of the time that would have been on its way out the octagon lovely shot really nice and Modestus is a young man he'll be back it's you know it's one of these things you put two prospects up against one another and someone's gonna someone's gonna pick up a loss that just looked it was just a great performance by Jimmy Crew. And and the more we see these kind of performances, look at that uppercut. And the more we see these kind of performances from him, the more his confidence is going to grow and the more he's going to become a contender. The truth is as well, you put Jimmy Crew, you stand, you do a lineup of the top 15 light heavyweights, you put Jimmy Crew in there and he looks like a boy compared to those guys in that, in that light heavyweight division. He's young. He's still got a lot of time to grow into his career, into his body. I like the fact that he's not forcing himself down to middleweight because I think if you walked into some gyms, they'd be trying to get a weight cut on him. And obviously, it's not the right thing to do. He's a he's, he's a big lad and he's going to become a man very soon <laughs> while he's in the process of developing his game with two great fighters in his corner. It's safe to say we can be excited for Jimmy Crew and his future. He's a good kid and he's, he's very, very talented. And watch the follow-up shots. Right hand over the top. Focuses on his head. Big uppercut. Chases him down, left hook. And that left hook's real short. Like, Modestus is already on his way out there. The three shots he took in that process, here we go again, overhand, uppercut, left hook. Wicked. Very, very nice. Congratulations, Jimmy Crew. I'm excited to see him progress. And unhurt as well. And here's Sam Greco and Dan Kelly in his corner. Awesome. Okay, co-main event. So, Jessica Andrade, first female fighter in the UFC to win in three weight classes. Incredible. Um, grab a water if you want. Um, we're always trying to stay hydrated out here. It's, it's very warm. Um, so, we're in the last minute of the, uh, of the first round. Jessica Andrade, as we know, <laughs> as Goldie always says to us, her nickname, Joe, translates to pile driver. Like she wants to pick you up and smash you to the floor. I think she's one of five fighters to win by slam. There you go. There's a bit of trivia for you. See, see if you can name the other ones. I'll give you one. Matt Hughes, Carlos Newton. Um, I'll give you another one. Matt Hughes, Carlos Newton. Uh, Frank Shamrock against... Oh, that was, that, was, that was pride. Yeah, he didn't win that fight, Bob Sapp. Anyway, um, the five slams in the UFC. Jessica Andrade got one of them against Rose and she tried her very best to get another one here tonight. So we had Andrade at bantamweight where she was picking ladies up and slamming them. Then she dropped 20 pounds to go to straw weight, became the champion, picking fighters up and slamming them, making it look much much easier with smaller, more, smaller athletes in, in front of her. Excuse me. She's moved up now. She's at flyweight. This is definitely a better weight class for her because she was always kind of caught between the two. She was just she's just too physical and muscular for um, for um, straw weight. It was I mean it was a big ask for her to cut down, but she did it. But in this fight against Chikagian, the, the dangers were staying at range and getting picked off, or hitting the floor and getting tangled up because Chikagian's got a brown belt. Henzo Gracie, John Dana, her brown belt. Um, she's also got great striking, great footwork from Mark Henry. So this was really the range that, uh, that that Andrade needed. She needed to be in like in that Goldilocks zone, like close enough but not too close. She needed to be not in her guard but not at the end of her punches. So up against the fence is ideal for her. So she gets this she gets this big pickup and slam here. 
and this is something that's worth worth watching as well. And this is a, a physical thing. This is a physicality thing. These two muscles down the side. Ooh, I can't draw on this when it's zoomed in. These two muscles down the side of the spine here. That's what you're working when you're deadlifting. A, a, among other things, that's what you're working when you're deadlifting. They're the muscles that pull your spine straight. And as you can see here, Ch Caitlin Chukagian's driving this arm in. She's breaking the posture of Andrage. But this just goes to show you how strong Andrage is because she's still able to lift her up in that position. Like bullies through all of that, picks her up and slams her. First thing you have to bear in mind is that that was a big slam. So that's taken the wind out of Caitlin Chukagian, who's now scrambling back to her feet. Now she's backed up against the fence. And something else that, that uh, Jessica Andrade mentioned, uh, something that her coach had said to her, which was a very good observation. Chukagian was the last fighter to step on the scales. She cut a decent amount of weight from what, what we could tell. And at least that was the impression that uh, Jessica Andrade has got. So her coach said, attack the body. Like if someone's lost a lot of weight, Attacking the body is a really, really smart thing to do because you just, you're just not yourself. You know, you can feel quite delicate rehydrating. You can feel quite weak from a, from a weight cut. And the shot that she landed, it was a beautiful left hook right to the solar plexus. In the break here, bang. Ooh. It's, it's actually not solar plexus. It's actually right in the stomach. And that will make you soil yourself. Like she thunders this into the midsection. You see the wind up, see her elbow here. The problem that she has is that she shows how hurt she is. Oh, and when you turn away like that, and it was unfortunate for her as well because it was right at the end of the round. Like if she'd have managed to just keep a game face on and dance around for 10 seconds, she'd have been able to sit on her stool. And she wouldn't have been the same going into the second round, don't get me wrong. But she also wouldn't have got to... Um, Jessica Andrade running at her with a double flying knee full sprint jump double flying knee and then she's into range again and then she lands another shot there it was the same shot to the same place watch it come in here bang right into the stomach clean we'll see it again from a different angle and she's just collapsed against the floor and, and honestly Getting caught with a body shot is the worst. I've never lost a fight to a body shot. Oh, we didn't, we didn't get a replay. Um, let's watch it again. There we go, 15 seconds, look. So it's landed about 13 seconds. Double flying knee, backs her up, second shot's there. And you can see the drive. And this, this, is, this is where the power in the legs comes from. Because you can see she's lowered a level. So as she steps in, this rear leg is bent here, and that becomes a spring. That's like a coil, that's like a coiled spring, and all of her power is going to drive from that up into that arm. It's like a it's like a shovel punch, is what to, some fighters call it, because you're digging your hands up and you're going into the midsection. Robbie Lawler's really good at hitting people under the chin with his rear hand. Look how she wings it back. <laughs> gut check not nice five seconds you know it, it's unfortunate because she, she, if she'd have been able to keep a game face on and not turned around and and, uh, and and shown how hurt she was um she may have been able to get out of that round but it just shows you how impactful these these shots are sometimes like i said i've never been stopped in a fight with a body shot but i always liked to stop people with body shots in kickboxing and muay thai fights because it's like they have to be there to witness their own defeat <laughs> You know, if you beat someone by knockout, they wake up 20 minutes later wondering what happened and they can watch it on their mate's phone and figure out what happened and they don't have to face the embarrassment in the moment. Whereas if I had someone I really didn't like, I'll tell you a quick story while we're here. I was fighting a guy once and he was, he was just real cocky. He was very arrogant, very cocky. He traveled into the UK to fight me and he was like swaggering to the ring. And, and I used to wear pink shorts when I was fighting because I was a bit of a prick as well. Bleach blonde hair, pink shorts. I, you know, I like to kind of get, you know, I like to mess with people a bit and get them to dislike me because it, it make, make the fights more interesting. This guy showed up with pink shorts, but it was like a baby pink. And he was walking, he had baby pink gloves to match. And there was girls in the front row that he'd brought to the event. And he was like winking, pointing at me. And I'm like, this dude's getting it. And right at the start of the fight, my coach said to me, don't knock him out in the first round. Stop him with a body shot in the second. I'm like, oh. Because I was fired up, I did really want to chin him. But this was the point where I realized that there was a beauty in the body shot. 
So anyway, I'd, I'd coasted for the first round. I'd let him do a bit of work, you know, build his confidence. Second round, I walked him down against the ropes and I hit him with this clean left hook to the body, proper Ricky Hatton. I was really into my, my Ricky Hatton at the time. Landed this clean left hook to the body and he just folded like a deck chair, just poof, hit the canvas. I turned around and walked back to my corner and somewhere on an old hard drive, I've got a photograph of it and I'm walking over to the corner and you can see this guy just kind of laid out, like crawling across the ring because of the pain he was in with his midsection. What was so nice about that is that he then had to sit there while he was trying to get his intestines in order, watching me get my arm raised, which I just thought was a beautiful moment in my career. And it was that turning point where I realized that there's, there's a real beauty in forcing people to, to watch that if there's been a bit of a dickhead leading up to the fight. So there's my little story. Okay, main event. I'm not gonna cover the whole five rounds because it was a, a fascinating, very tactical fight. And if I played the whole thing through, you'd be sitting there watching me watch the, watch the fight again, which is probably not that interesting for you. Because as most of you will notice, you had to watch me because I couldn't hold still during the fight anyway. Um, so Ortega came in looking very slick. He, he constantly changed his angles. He changed his distance from the zombie. He kept throwing in this little, little, this little tap to the leg as well, which was problematic for zombie because he really just wants to stand and trade. If he thinks you're going to level change and he then has to start thinking about takedown defense, it's like, oh, I want to just keep moving forward. And you can see a few times it starts to stifle his movement. As zombie throws a punch, you can see Ortega just slip out the way and he just touches the inside leg. But watch how it changes zombie's momentum. Like he, he immediately stops and starts thinking about defense. It's just, it's just throwing a wrench in the works, throwing a spanner in the works for people that are watching in, in the UK. Just tag and, and zombies defensive. It was, a, it was a really nice move. And Ortega at this point had done it a couple of times. So zombies now, look, he's, he's tempting him again. So zombies now starting to get frustrated. And then you see him coming, marching forward. And this is where Ortega sets him up for probably the best shot that he landed in the fight. Pow. Lovely. Zombie was overzealous. He came crashing forward because he's like, you keep fainting this takedown, I want to hit you. So he comes crashing forward and he walks straight onto that elbow. And, and fortunately for Zombie, it actually hits it. It actually lands on the tricep instead of the point of the elbow. Point of the elbow and it would have been game over because he had that forward momentum. But then just to reinforce the takedown, especially given the fact that Zombie's now really not convinced that Ortega is going to go for a takedown. As he steps in here, it allows Ortega to get a little closer so even though Zombie's framing, he's able to get his hands on him and drag that single leg into his midsection. Drives him to the fence, attacks the far side leg, pulls his, pulls his legs together, sucks him up and lands. And this is, this, is the point where, this is the point where Khabib starts to do his work. This is where he binds his legs, which is what Brian Ortega doesn't do. And I'm just diverting slightly. But this is the, the, the old Dagestani leg irons that Felder and I were talking about. Um, so that what, what would happen normally is with, with Khabib is he would feed this leg across and he would triangle it with this, with this knee. And then he's isolated those legs, which stops Zombie doing what he does here or would stop whoever he's fighting. Pulls his legs through and then he's able to start working back to his feet, which now forces Ortega to start controlling with his hands instead. I mean, Ortega's doing a decent job of controlling one of those legs, but he's just not, he's more interested in attacking that guillotine. And look at, I mean, that, if that's not a zombie coming out of a grave, look at that. <laughs> it's like Night of the Living Dead. Like he, and the reason he's doing that is because he knows that that guillotine's there. He's trying to keep his back, the back of his head up against the fence as he's moving up so Ortega doesn't loop over and start attacking that neck. Because you don't even want to give him half a clamp on the neck. And, and Ortega knows that he's not going to get that and he's going to allow the body lock as a zombie comes up. So he hits him with the elbow there. That was a lovely sequence. One of the main things that stood out for Ortega in this fight for me was how he started to couple his, his striking in with everything else he was using. I know there was a clash of heads in a little while that I'm going to cover. Um, but <clears throat> the flurry to the takedown to the right hand and then, go, you know, like, obviously, he, he comes up to his feet there, lands an elbow, and then goes straight back to a takedown. That mixing of his martial arts is really, really beautiful. And, and what we'd seen from Ortega before is he was either boxing or he was grappling. And there was a, there was a clear line between the two, which he would switch from one to another. This, this blurring of these lines is, is really what's going to make Ortega a difficult individual to deal with. Watch this. Zombies coming forward. You'll see what I mean about the impact point. Look at that. Because you can see the point of the elbow. 
he's past the zombie. It was the power of the tricep that hit him. The next angle's better. Oh, I mean, you've got to think. If zombies, if zombies here, that's game over. That is game over. That was a lovely knockdown there. Really nice work by Brian Ortega. Not only seeing the vulnerability that we've already seen from Zombie in the Yair Rodriguez fight, but also tempted him with that that low single, that that uh, single leg, and getting Zombie kind of annoyed. And there was a lot of that going on in this fight. Ortega played it calm and was very, 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 very uh, studious in his approach. He read and he and he looked and he saw the openings and he took them when they were there. Like this, this straight left that he, yeah. He is looking sharp. This straight left that he throws to the body here, from the zombie's perspective, is this a takedown? Who knows? He reacts as if it's a takedown, though, because he sees the level change. So he then starts reacting. He starts to kick his hips back like he's going to meet a takedown. But as you can see, he's got one hand up and one hand reached out. So that midsection is wide open. Unfortunately for, for Ortega, it doesn't land clean because you can see his, his hand come through the opposite side there. Um, but there were a few body shots that were landed by Ortega that were good. And, and the, the bigger picture is mixing the targets up, look, gr drags that lead leg towards him. This, it was the constant mixing up of the ranges. He throws outside kicks, he throws high kicks, he's coming inside with the jab, he's throwing a straight left. He's fainting the takedown, then slipping away. There's the spinning elbow if you start getting too close to him. The, the consistent thing for Ortega was the playing of the lead hand. And we get this a lot with Southpaw, the orthodox fighters. They, they'll, they'll control the outside and then they'll come through the center of the guard, which as the fight progressed, we saw even more from that from Ortega because he had that cut to start working on. Um, but the variety of his shots, his willingness to, to give a little ground and move away, cut an angle and move laterally along the fence is, is what's going to set him apart in, in this weight class from a lot of other guys. You know, I think we're going to get the takedown here. I mean, look at those significant strikes. Like, he, he led the dance in the first round. He really set the stall out in the first round. He's like, this is what you're up against. You're not going to be able to hit me as much as I'm going to be able to hit you. And I've also got a bunch of other facets to my game. The second round was a lot more even, but that's because Zombie tried to pick it up a bit more. But now we're in the third round. We've got 30 seconds left, and Ortega's more than doubling his strikes again. So like, it's like this ebb and flow of zombie. It's like bad round, pick his pace up, bad round, pick his pace up. And, and he did try to ramp towards the end of the fight. It just wasn't enough because he, he was then, by the time the fourth round had arrived, he was more focused on what Ortega was doing than what he was doing. And that's, that's not zombie. Like he decides what he's going to do and you've got to deal with it. I talk about the Moicano fight over and over again. It's one of my favorite knockouts in the whole of UFC. It was simple, it was beautiful, it was poetic. He was waiting for the jab. He knew Moicano was going to open up with a jab because it's the most common punch to start with. And he timed it perfectly, came over the top, cracked him clean. At this point in the fight, at the end of the third round, which again, statistically, third round is best for Ortega. Most of his wins are in the first round, even if he's lost the first two. At this point in the fight, the zombie's now really not sure what he's up against because he's tried to get reads on him. And every time he gets a read on something, it changes. He gets a different look. He gets something that, you know, surprises him, knocks him down, takes him down, snaps a lead, and that snaps the lead single and then hits him with the midsection. Another attempt at a takedown here breaks with a strike. Like this, and I know, and I know these are minor things to think about, but these are developments that I've seen in his game. And, and I also want to say this. Going into the main, into the the world title fight, uh, Brian Ortega, as I said, he was in my in my opinion, he was a third round fighter. You know, he gives the first two rounds, he cruises, he takes his time, and then he steps on the gas and he starts to take people out late in the third round, like four ten on the clock, four forty on the clock. That's the Clay Guida and the Moicano fights, I think. Um. So going into the Holloway fight, I'm thinking to myself, this is really going to set him in good stead for for uh, Max Holloway. Because like like I was saying earlier in the in the night in the in the show, I like to look at stats to see where people do their best work. And Max Holloway is different to the majority of other fighters in the UFC because his first round is always his worst round. He's a slow starter, and I think that's one of the reasons why Ortega fought like he did. Max Holloway's success rate and output is lower in the first round, then it gets better in the second, better in the third. Fourth and fifth, he's on fire. He's landing most of his shots and he's, he's 
doubling his pace from the earlier rounds. So Max Holloway, it's like he's like it's like a, a like a, a boulder rolling down a hill. You know, it starts off steady and then it gathers momentum as it gets towards the end of the fight. Brian Ortega's like that, but we'd not seen him in, into five rounds up until that point. So I was expecting that same men mentality from Brian Ortega, which I thought would kind of match Max Holloway. As they both started to improve and pick up their pace, I thought those championship rounds were going to be electric. For whatever reason, Brian Ortega decided he was going to start fast. And that was what cost him because he was walking onto things and making Max Holloway's job much easier. So then as Max Holloway started to pick up his pace, he'd already done so much damage in the first few rounds that Brian Ortega was already too far in the hole to dig himself out and taking too much damage. It, it doesn't suit Brian Ortega to fight like that. But this new Brian Ortega is much more in control of his pace. He's much more in control of the fight. And he's also, he's also given his opponent constant different looks, which makes it very difficult for them to settle into a game plan. Like, there were a lot of single shots from Brian Ortega, but it wasn't like he was going back to the same thing over and over again. You know, like, like we saw with Jimmy Crute, very, very effective with the right hand, but it was either the low kick or the right hand. For Brian Ortega, what was it? He's, now he's orthodox. Like, now the, now the zombie's like, oh, now, now I've got to change my whole game plan because he switched his stance. Like, wh whenever, whenever I was thinking about, um, about switching stances, I, I work a lot on visualizations. And one of my visualizations is an old cassette tape deck. And I don't know why I've used this. But if I was working the day I was working Southport, I would do this meditation, this visualization meditation, where I would pop the cassette tape out and put my orthodox tape on the table and load the Southpaw tape. And it was just a way of me kind of switching over my skill sets, which, you know, in hindsight now has got limitations because I should have been working far more uh, mixing in, in the process. But it was, you know, I, I, was, I was trained as an orthodox fighter. Um, so it was just my way around kind of switching off that mindset and putting a different one on. But then if I apply that analogy to a fight, if I've got an opponent that's orthodox, I've got my orthodox cassette tape in, then he switches to southpaw, then before I can adjust, he switches back to orthodox. I don't get started because I'm constantly being reactive to what they're doing. And and the bigger picture in this fight was that, that Brian Ortega was constantly showing him different things. Okay, fourth round. We're about 90 seconds in, and this is where the clash of heads happen. So... Couple of inside low kicks, picking at him from the distance, reaches reaches in and runs him towards the fence. And again, we're seeing coupling of striking with grappling. So great balance from Zombie hopping back, covering distance with his base foot. As he gets towards the, the fence, Ortega lets go, but he lets go of his leg real high. Like look how he's elevating his leg as he goes. So what we got? Zombie's leg is Zombie's foot's there, right? It's just above knee line. Watch at the point it falls. It's knee line. Ortega lifts it to the waist, catches the ankle. Now it's coming up. Now he's going to elevate it to his chest. So you've got to think that Zombie's weight is now going backwards as his legs coming up, unless he's got super duper Van Damme flexibility, which I've not not seen from the Zombie. Like as he's going down, his momentum's falling into the fence. You can even see he's reaching his his right arm out to brace himself here because he knows he's going towards the fence. What I love about this moment, though, is that Brian Ortega lets go and fires a right hand. And he doesn't land it, but he tries. There it is, look. Throws it out of the way, pings him with the right hand. And Zombie was fortunately out of the way because that would have been a very impactful shot given the fact that his momentum was moving behind the punch. And then we get the takedown. But now we cut. Okay, the reason I've picked this out and i focused on it is I know it was a clash of heads. But the reaction of Zombie is what is what's the most most important thing for me. And I, I did throw in a, an, a, a oh look at that again, breaks the clinch, sees the opportunity, beautiful elbow onto the chin. <sighs> Zombie can take a shot, I mean, as you would imagine with with someone that's nicknamed Zombie. But uh, he took some real good shots in this fight, and Ortega landed some. It wasn't for want for for lack of of Ortega trying to get the fight finished. Okay. My neck is aching. Watch, watch the zombie's reaction here. Because in some circumstances, this fight wouldn't have been stopped for the doctor to check it. There's a reason why the doctor checked it. And, and as we're backing up, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want you to watch the zombie right now. Wipes. Wipes, looks at his hand. Wipes again, looks at his hand. And then the referee jumps in and stops it. Okay. 
Now go back, and just as they break, I want you to focus on the referee. Wukash Borshevsky, I believe. Watch the referee here. So he's paying attention to zombie. Now what he's looking for if, if a fighter's cut is whether that's running into their eye. The only reason the fight would be stopped from a cut is if the blood was impairing their vision. That's when it becomes detrimental to the fight. You can bleed all you like in a fight. You can make as much mess as you like. like the only fight I've ever seen abandoned from, from too much blood was the Nicholas Dalby-Ross Houston fight, Cage Warriors. But that wouldn't have been stopped in the UFC because this is a canvas and the UFC uh, the, and Cage Warriors use like a plastic tarp so it can be reused, which obviously doesn't absorb the blood. Um, and as, as those of you watch the, the war rooms that were recorded back at my house, I've got a canvas that's covered in blood. And that's, um, that's from uh, Fabricio Verdum, as well as a couple of other guys on that card. Um, this canvas is new every time. This canvas would, after this event, it, especially in the current climate, I wouldn't ever be able to get a canvas now. In the current climate, this canvas will be taken immediately and incinerated. Because it's the only, the only solution to, to just getting rid of all that germ, all those germs and bacteria. Um, and that, that canvas I had, that, I mean, I, I had to fight tooth and nail for it. And I had a lot of people in the organization that were trying to help me out for it. Because I've wanted one for a while. Um, so it's, it's a very rare thing to have. And I, I appreciate the UFC for, for hooking me up with that to build the set. Um, that, had to be, that had to be isolated for 12 months before I could get it. And, and the, that's the difference is that this canvas will soak up the blood. And other, other events that reuse their canvas, it just stays on the surface. So it's not a blood thing. It's a vision thing. The referee is watching the zombie now. He's not looking at the cut necessarily. He's looking at how the zombie's reacting to the cut. Wipes it. Look at the referee. He's like, is that, is that bothering him? Is that, is that affecting his eyesight? Steps in. Come in, doctor. Come and have a look at this cut. Tell me if it's running into his eyes. That's what it's about. So it was the kind of similar to the, to the, the, the co-main event. So you can see the blood is actually running down the side of the eye. Like there's a little bit of swelling, but the cut's, the cut's right at the side of the eye. It's here. It's here. So it's going to run, naturally run down the side of his face here. I've only ever been cut once, and it was the same position. It doesn't run into your eye. The cuts that are problematic are the ones that are right across your brow line or on the eyelid themselves because they will just they, they impair your vision. And that's the main problem. If a fighter can't see, they can't fight. It's the same with swelling. So the doctor comes in, checks it. Yep, you're fine. Get on with it. And the fight continues. Here's the clash of heads. And as as we were as as this fight was playing out, I actually I threw in a reference. I know a few of you like old school references from other fights. There was a fight that always stood out to me, and it was it was a, a fighter called Edwin Duiz. Um and it was a fight on the Ultimate Fighter. He was up against uh, uh, Gideon Ray, and Edwin Duiz, Unfortunately for him, he had bleach blonde hair, and he got cut in his hairline. I'm talking about it, but it's, it's, I've pulled it in for you so you can see it. Okay, here we go. Look at the strikes here. First, second, third round. I mean, he's, he's leading the dance as we continue on. Look at that. He's like he's, he's, he's landing considerably cleaner strikes, but more strikes than the zombies landing. And the zombies work rate's dropping off. After having a bad first round, he comes in to try and push the pace in the second round and pays for it by getting knocked down. And then third and fourth, now he's really down. I mean, he's barely in double figures at this stage. So he reaches, and Brian Ortega comes up. It's completely accidental here. He comes up. He's not intending to clash the heads, but that's where it happened. Clash, and then he runs forward, and there we go. We'll see it one more time. There it is. Like It's, it's not intentional. It, it, it's, it amazes me how little it happens in MMA, to be honest. Um, I mean, I was watching the undercard of the Lomachenko um, Lopez fight last night, which was a very strange fight, but very enjoyable. And I, I may do a breakdown of it, depending on whether we want to. Want to I don't know whether they'll probably flag the video because it's boxing and they'll be they'll be on that kind of stuff. But I might do a breakdown in the future if the video is available. Um, but there was a, the, the co-main event of that. There was one fighter in it that was, he was clearly trying to open up his opponent with his head quite clearly trying to use his head to open him up. And he did manage to do it. Fortunately, he didn't win the fight because that would have really annoyed me. Okay, but here's the clash of heads. So remember, it was the way that the zombie reacted to the cut, not the cut itself. It was the fact that he was wiping at it and checking it, wiping and checking. 
it showed a concern. It showed possibly impaired vision. This is the fight I was talking about. Okay. So chap on top, this is Edwin Deweese, who, much like Jimmy Crew, just looked like a like a like a boy in a in a in a sport full of men. Gideon Ray was a solid power puncher that had good striking skills. But once he was grounded, he was very much struggling in this fight. But he throws a cut, he throws an elbow from the bottom. It's not that one. It's coming up in a second. He throws an elbow from the bottom and it cuts Edwin Deweese. Here it is. Bang. That's it. That was it. And it just clips Edwin Deweese. Point of the elbow right in his hairline. But watch, I mean, watch. I'll just play it through. Just watch the amount of blood that comes out of this cut. And it was tiny, tiny. It's already spraying on the canvas here, look. It's already on his opponent. It's leaking out of his head. It is leaking out of his head. <laughs> Sits up, he's like, ah, yeah, okay, you got me. Good shot. And he even says it. He even says, he's a, a svelte-looking Matt Serra. He even says, right as the referee stops it, and I love a bit of gamesmanship. So this was the ultimate fighter back in the day. And it, it, this, I mean, you know, when we say when we say it's pouring like a faucet, I mean, literally, look at that. <laughs> That's almost as much ketchup as I like to have on my uh, on my chips. Look at that. But so the referee stops it and then he, and he glances at Gideon Ray and he's like, "Yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> a good one." <laughs> this is a hell of a fight. They end, they end up going to a third a third and final like a like a deciding round. Look at Matt Sarah looking thick neck, slim, trim. There's about three hundred kilos less of pasta in his system at that point. But. Dr. D said, no, he's fine, he's all right. You can see it's up in the hairline. And once he wipes it, like the fight continues on and it doesn't look that significant. So the referee restarts and back in the same position. But immediately, it's just pouring out again. <laughs> but this is the veteran move. This is the, this is the reason why this stuck in my mind. Is because, so this is the second round of a fight. Ultimate Fighter, as you know, is two rounds. And if it's, I mean, it's literally, look at that. But that's the point. So the Ultimate Fighter... Let me just leave it at that point there for all those people that like to talk shit on cage fight and how brutal it is. Yes, it is. It's absolutely brutal. We love it. Um, the ultimate fighter. So you get two rounds. If if a judge is not decided, if the judges are not decided who's the winner, you get a third round. But this is halfway through the second round and he's already bleeding pretty bad. And had Gideon Ray been able to stuff his takedowns, the doctor may have stopped this because the blood would have probably been running into his eye. The fact that Dweez was able to ground the fight allowed him to kind of pour the blood onto the canvas and on his opponent instead of pouring it down his own face. But the veteran move here is what do you do when you get a cut? You cover it up, right? You put a hand on it, a bad cut. I had a friend once, he was opening a window at school and as he pushed the window to open it, the, the, the glass smashed and it just shredded his wrist and opened him up bad. I mean, one of, one of our classmates ran over and immediately put his hand on it to stop the bleeding. It's, it's the common sense thing to do. You should have seen it when the paramedics got there and he had to try and peel his hand off because it would already start to congeal. Anyway, Edwin Deweese here in this moment. I love this fight. I got a note from TJ DeSantos. Shout out to TJ, uh, commentator on EBI and uh, an Invicta. Great commentator. And, and he remembered this fight. So you can see Deweese has got an underhook here. Watch what he does with his hand. Let me just put that on there. And he holds his hand over the cut while he's ground and pounding him. Like, that's a veteran move. Like, to be aware you've got a cut's fine. To be pouring at it and reaching for it because it might be impairing your visions when it's going to be a problem because the referee or the or the doctor could stop it. But this is Dewey's being a pro and just covering it up. I just wanted to throw that in there so you so the people that had not seen that fight know, know what I'm talking about. Um, so it was the reaction to the cut from Zombie that was the reason why it was stopped, not necessarily the cut itself. But what it did do is it gave Brian Ortega a target in this last round. And he picked at this cut beautifully with his jab, um, which, you know, it's, it's a part of the sport. I have no problem with it. If somebody's injured, if I know someone's got an injury, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tear that injury apart best I can. But Ortega was constantly moving along the edge. And this, you know, from a basic mindset, look at that jab he's working. From a basic mindset, you would say that Zombie's got octagon control, but he's controlling nothing at this point. He's controlling nothing. Ortega's deciding where this fight goes. He's deciding which direction Zombie's moving because he's the one that's cutting the angles and, and skirting along the fence. Um, and and watch, this is what I was talking about, playing with the lead hand. Tap on the outside of the glove a couple of times and then come straight up the center line. Bang. 
Like Zombie even brings his hand out because he's expecting another, he's expecting to meet this again. Watch. Look, see, see, Ortega keeps tapping and the zombie keeps reaching to meet his hand. And then the point zombie reaches to meet, it's not there. And it's ping right on his, right on his face. It's, it was a great performance by Brian Ortega. I was so, I was so pleased for him to see this because to come off a loss like he had to regroup and to, to be able to put this kind of performance together. Very, very impressive. And you've got to think how now he matches up against uh, against Volkanovski because Volkanovski is a, a good wrestler. He's got good takedowns. He's got great striking from what we saw in, in his fights against Max Holloway. He's he's at a deficit with reach and height against Brian Ortega. He's also at a deficit with his with his submission game if it hits the floor because Brian Ortega, even if he's put on his back, he's dangerous. So if Volkanovski is at range. He's going to have to deal with this footwork. He's going to have to deal with this variety of striking. He's most likely going to want to try and close Ortega down and get close to him so he can either land his combination strikes or he can get the fight to the floor. In the process of getting the fight to the floor, he's got to watch those guillotines. And once it hits the floor, he can't just continue to work his ground and pound. He's got to be cautious of those triangles. And like Brian Ortega, um, he, he triangled um, Diego Brandao, who's an excellent grappler. Like th there are a lot of skills in Brian Ortega's game that we that we just don't see because he does not taken into those ranges. But when he is, when he's forced to use those ranges, we see him excel. The grip strength he's got, we talked about it. He's he's like a career climber. He's a, look at that significant strikes. The personal best is 110. Like he's cruising towards his personal best here. It, it's it's a really impressive performance and just commanded the octagon so well. Kept himself safe. Picked the zombie off as he was moving forward, made him miss, punished him in every every opportunity, and kept changing his angles and his attack. Very, very impressive. For me, Brian Ortega has absolutely earned himself a shot at the title. And I even think a fight against Max Holloway would look very different this time around. This Brian Ortega fighting smart and choosing his battles is much better than the Brian Ortega that went in there against uh, against Max Holloway and, and came for war in the first round. And watch him pull this elbow tick end of the round zombie comes forward oh. <laughs> I mean to stop hey. Ooh. nearly killed you great performance thoroughly enjoyed that night of fights oh we got a couple of replays we'll just enjoy the replays there's the overhand from the first round oh my neck spinning elbow spinning tricep maybe Lovely front kick to the face. Again, variety. Strikes on the break. Strikes into and out of the clinch. The command of his jab, working that inside hand, uh, you know, pouring the lead hand. And it was a great performance. It was very impressive. And, and I kind of, in my head, I was kind of leaning slightly towards Zombie because I felt like he had the knockout power. Like at some point, Ortega was going to have to come into his range and I thought Zombie might be able to crack him with something that at least hurt him to the point where he might win rounds and get the decision. But Ortega just, I mean, I'm, obviously that's basing on Ortega who, uh, you know, who we've seen previously. The Ortega that fought Max Holloway maybe have walked onto something against Zombie. But this Brian Ortega with the new shiny head. And respect for uh, for doing what he did and donating your hair, my friend. No one wants a grey wig or I'd donate some of mine. Um, great fight. <laughs> great fight. See you next time.